I'm Gary Mavis, and I've had a lifelong obsession with classic cars. I caught the bug when I was just a small child, but since then I've been lucky enough to own and restore many of these rare beauties. Over the years I've learned how to tackle the complex mechanics of these cars, but still managed to indulge my passion along the way. But now I want to share my experiences with you, revealing the joys, the trials and the tribulations of classic car restoration. Each episode I'll meet fellow classic car enthusiasts to hear their stories, look at their cars and share their personal experiences. So come with me on my journey as I search from here to Europe and as far as the USA for the cars of my dreams. Discover their unique histories whilst working on them bring them back to life. So join me, Gary Mavis, a classic obsession. The Toyota Land Cruiser is legendary. Originally commissioned by the US military whilst occupying Japan in 1950, it went on to become the official vehicle for Japan's National Police Reserve. In 1954, it was given its name, Land Cruiser. In 1955, it evolved from a military to a civilian utility vehicle and was adapted to become more spacious inside and easier to manoeuvre. Its low compression engine, first seen in 1948, wasn't discontinued until 1992 and it's widely revered as one of the most indestructible engines ever produced. I just came across this car recently, just arrived into the UK and purchased new by a 21-year-old Australian sheep farmer on his first day at work. Now, after 50 years of loyal companionship, he decided to part with it on his retirement. This 1970s example is part of the third generation 40 series, launched in 1960. It's totally no-nonsense and completely bulletproof. Well, supposedly. Its worst enemy, of course, being the bleak winters and salted roads of Great Britain. And this particular model belongs to me brother Lee. And after years of being passed from pillar to post and bad workmanship, as a good brother, I decided to pick up the baton and try and put things right. Had I bitten off more than I could chew? Well, you can be the judge of that. So after a full service and a new alternator, fitting two new Varta batteries and renewing the battery terminals, new plugs, new leads, radiator hoses and having the leaking oil cooler remade, I then set about disassembly. So if you take a closer look at the wing underneath, you can see where somebody over the years has put little repairs in like this, well, this big plate here. Um, I'm looking at several other repairs. There's this one, this one. It's been pretty patched up over the years. Now, for me to bear metal this, I'd be an absolute mug. I mean, it's not as if I'm doing up a new Ferrari or, you know, a top of the range car. After all, this is an agricultural vehicle. And I think once I've done my repairs, primed, painted it, it looked apart. I suppose with any restoration, the first port of call is to clear off all the dirt, any surface rust, any oil, and basically see what we've got. And then get rid of those ugly wheels. Remember your first day at school, guys? And the first thing you did was look at people's shoes when they walked up to you? You always looked at the feet and then looked up to the person. Well, that's what I do with cars as well. When I drove this for the first time, it was a death trap. The steering was pulling me all over the road and it was impossible to control. Body panels were under stress and wouldn't line up. This had obviously been rolled many times in the past, but hopefully the chassis wasn't bent and I could improve this ride by swapping out these wheels, which are obviously too wide for the car, and simply tracking it in. So I then set about sorting some original wheels for the car. I managed to source a set from a guy in Kent. These were with the original suicide ring, infamous for cutting people's heads off. When the ring isn't seated properly and the car turns a corner and hits a bump, it's been known to fly off and cut the head clean off of some poor, unsuspecting pedestrian. So, anyway, stripped, primed and painted, they came up a treat. I then line the insides of the wheels so there's no snagging on a new inner tube ready to be fitted. I then fit a full set of Goodrich all-terrain tyres, just to complete the job. And now I'm happy the car looks right and back to stock. I 
I then moved underneath the car, and on closer inspection, this car really was a piece of junk. It was in terrible condition. Now, this is the steering section. There was holes in the poles, the ends were all knackered, the rubbers were all split, they'd all dried up, the shocks were wrecked, the poles were bent. I mean, it really was looking like a piece of junk. I can see from this point that this car's going to need everything. So then commenced literally days of disassembly. Buzzing off all that rust and oil. Undoing them seized ends. And undoing loads of them seized up bolts. And then eventually, when everything was stripped and I started to paint everything up, and all the new ends were fitted, it started to take shape. And then a jigsaw puzzle began of what goes where. New shocks were fitted. The axle was painted up. I even had to cut some nuts that were cross-threaded off the wheel and spinning, just so I could get it off. And I also had to cut new threads on some of the studs that came out of the brake drums. Literally, nothing was easy. The old leaf springs were a joke. Some of them were even broken. And the previous owner decided to fit extra springs at the back, so they were coming off. This was probably to compensate for the broken leaf springs. Why didn't he just fit new leaf springs instead? Well, they won't be going on eBay. The oil cooler had been dripping onto the front chassis like for years, so that all had to be scraped off with the razor, as well as oil blown back all over the prop shaft and the underneath of the rest of the car. Another dirty job. Oh, the reality. The linkages for the leaf springs were another challenge. With plenty of heat on them, eventually they came out. Those bottom plates were stripped of all the oil and the rust and repainted. And I found this ingenious way of using an engine hoist to lift the car and it just eased the fitment. A little bit of grease, a little bit of persuasion and the shackles go in nice and easy. And once the leaf springs were on, I noticed a little bit of improvisation with the hammer there, on went the jewellery. Tightened up into the bottom plate and you can see the suspension really starts to take shape. Look at that. Nice and clean, nice and maintainable. Notice the new brake lines there. I start to mask up everything so that nothing had spoils with the paint. And then the underside of the wing, or the wheel arch, or both, are stone chipped and then painted in. I also noticed there was a rubber covering missing over the shock absorber, but I just managed to replicate one out of a sheet of rubber I had in the garage. So I then moved on to the rear springs, which are basically the same format. And once they were all buttoned up, the shock went in, the axle was painted, suspension complete. Oh, the car also had no brakes, so the drums were all rebuilt and readjusted. And then top tip, guys. When you refit the wheels after painting, always take the top film of paint off where the nut meets the wheel. I've made this mistake in the past, guys, and you literally get a few miles up the road and you think, what's that knocking noise? And the wheels come loose. Because that film of paint in between the nut and the wheel, I promise you, it'll back off. The exhaust was a bit worse for wear. A few holes here and there. So off with the old and on with the brand new one. It's nice and clean. Now these mug guards or wing coverings, whatever you want to call them, I thought I'd take them off and take the car right back to standard spec. I mean, look at this. Someone's taking a can opening to this one. This is disgraceful. Look at that. Oh, well. That's going to be going back on. The wings were then repaired. I took all the scabby bits back to bare metal, filled them, blocked them out, ready for prime. And they should come up nice. I did exactly the same with the bonnet. And look at this bull bar. That's definitely got to come off. And them spotlights. They just don't look right. And the way this car's been driving, well, that's just a potential death threat for people crossing the road. The main intention at this point was just to make the car drivable and safe. 
And another thing we really need to investigate is when I followed him down here when he was dropping the car off, every time he turned left, the whole body of the car seemed to lift up off the chassis. It was like it had become detached. And at one point, I just thought the whole cabin was going to separate from the car and roll off. So, you know I mentioned earlier about the bleak winters and salted roads of Britain? Well, this is the kind of damage they're capable of doing. And considering this car originated from the heavy winters of Finland, it stood absolutely no chance. These are the main mounts that connect the body to the chassis. And as you can see, they're completely gone. Really, well and truly, this car should have been scrapped. You know, when I was younger, my old man used to say to me, never fall in love with a car, Gary. It'll drain your finances and it'll be the death of you. But you know what? This has been brother's pride and joy. So I'm going to do my best to save it. But I just figured that if I can just cut back the rot so far as to hit clean metal and manage to weld the plate in with the same heavy grade steel, we might just be in with a chance. You can see the rubber mount that sandwiches between the shell and the chassis. <laughs> and the road on the other side. But first, I've got to figure a way of separating the body from the chassis so I'm able to weld from underneath. In comes the engine hoist to the rescue once again. To top it all, just to add to me problems, my welder started playing up. So apologies for the messy welding, guys. But it was solid, and I managed to weld it nice and cleanly from underneath, and it'll well outlast the car. And now that's out the way, I commenced a massive clean-up, removing years of grime, oil, and rubbish. Getting into every nook and cranny, and painstakingly scrubbing and panel wiping every surface down before preparing for paint. So after days of cleaning and prepping, I decided to hit it with the paint. And I'm sure you'll agree, it was definitely worth all the hard work. I mean, what a transformation. It also had like a tiny Ford Capri Sport steering wheel fitted, but I managed to find an old original one on the floor of a scrapyard. It was a little bit rough, but... <laughs> It scrubbed up rather well and completed the job nicely. Look at that, back to stock. With the interior looking good, I then move outside and with the help of my mate Kenny, the glass man, remove the windscreen to continue the prepping for paint. With new door seals purchased, along with a new screen rubber, I clean off all the old glue and ready the door shut for paint. I decided to paint the body in original Toyota Heath Grey with a white roof to match.
After all the prep, the paint job was pretty straightforward, but the fact that the car was too tall to get into the garage was a real pain in the arse. It meant I had to source some low VOC water-based paint to be able to paint safely outside. This car's a lot bigger than you can imagine. And because of this and the sheer height of the vehicle, I found it easier to paint the car in sections. You can see where it blocked out here that during its life it's been just about every colour of the rainbow. And it's hard to believe that this car initially started out as red. Just a few more finishing details just to make sure I've got rid of all that yellow paint. A new set of badges. And let's not forget to grease up all those shackles. Four long months later. And voila! It's back on its original wheels and steering straight. Originally, when these cars came from the factory, they came with a one-piece moulded rubber mat over the front floors. I got this especially made from a company in Australia. Just to complete that all original look, I made the mug guards from a sheet of rubber I had and inserted the badges. But my favourite original detail was the rear number plate, angled so that police helicopters in Japan could read the number. Japan began exporting the Land Cruiser in 1957, and in 1965 the 50th thousandth one rolled off the production line, followed by the 100,000th in 1968, after rumours that Land Rover allegedly paid Toyota millions for them not to market them in the UK, fearing they bankrupt the company whilst also showing them up for their substandard inferior qualities. Britain eventually started official sales in 1975, with the landmark million sales being achieved in 1980, spanning its 14 model range and celebrating its 70th anniversary last year. The Land Cruiser had stacked up an unbelievable 10 million sales worldwide. So after four long months working outside in all weathers, it was from this, to this. You know, on one hand, I was pleased that another Doom Classic had been potentially rescued. But whether that was appreciated, well, that's questionable. A couple of years on, I revisit to check out its state. I'm told it hasn't been washed since its return. Those wheels are being put back on and being too wide have put so much stress on the steering that it actually snapped the components. The small sports steering wheel had been refitted and that moulded one-piece rubber mat that I had specially made in Australia had gone. Oh, and that rear number plate? Oh well, each to their own I suppose. You know, I suppose I've got to respect the fact that it's his car and whatever he wants to do with it, that's his prerogative. He's even mentioned that he might put the bull bar back on and he liked it better yellow. So, did I bite off more than I could chew? <laughs> Probably. Thank you for watching this episode of Gary Mather's Classic Obsession. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. And join me next time when I visit Germany's answer to the Rolls-Royce, Stuttgart's masterpiece, the Mercedes-Benz 600 limousine. <laughs>